During World War II, Japanese troops under the command of the Imperial family and the legendary General Yamashita are said to have buried a fortune in treasure in the Philippines. The story goes that it was looted during the Japanese march across Asia. Some say it was the largest hoard in history. The quantities that people talk about over here, I mean, are mind-boggling. You're talking not tons, but hundreds of tons of gold. You're chasing something that's a, that's a real dream. There's romance, adventure, excitement, and it allows grown men to be little boys again. Rumors of a vast treasure left by the Japanese began to sweep the Philippines shortly after the war. The rumors have never died away. Books and internet websites have helped to spread the story of Yamashita's gold. Its most dramatic version claims that during the war, the Japanese imperial family masterminded an operation to loot the territories the Japanese had conquered, and that towards the end of the war, they buried hundreds of tons of stolen gold in sites throughout the Philippines. Sterling Seagrave, an American author, has spent a couple of decades investigating Yamashita's gold. We know that there were 175 imperial treasure sites, and these sites have marked on them the quantity of gold that was hidden in each vault. They had hidden $100 billion, $1945 worth of treasure in the Philippines. Like many Filipinos, Marcos was also fascinated by legends of Yamashita's gold. In the late 60s, rumors began to circulate that Marcos had found the treasure, rumors that Marcos himself encouraged. Well, Marcos started out with less than $60,000 in assets according to his tax returns when he took over as president in 1966. In 1970, it became apparent he was making a lot more money than his presidential salary. And he called in the local press and said, do you know how I made my pile, boys? I found the treasure of Yamashita. Marcos claimed that he'd first got hold of maps to the Yamashita treasure as a guerrilla fighting the Japanese in the northern Philippines. Few believed him later on when he and his wife Imelda said that he'd actually found Yamashita's gold. But in 1971 came a discovery that indelibly linked Marcos's name with Yamashita's gold and appeared to provide concrete proof of the existence of the treasure itself. They found a golden Buddha at three feet. The height, the height is three feet and uh, the weight is one ton. Henry's father, Rogelio Rojas, a Filipino locksmith and treasure hunter, claimed to have found a solid gold Buddha in a tunnel behind a hospital in the former Japanese stronghold of Baggio. He believed the Buddha was part of Yamashita's private hoard. For a quarter of a century, treasure hunters had been searching for the gold. Now, here was a startling piece of evidence for the authenticity of the Yamashita's gold story. Rojas said that he'd been given a map by a former Japanese officer which showed the whereabouts of the Buddha. We know there's Buddha there because of the map, but to locate the entrance is really very hard. It took us 17 days because it's already blasted. So that is how we entered the body. We found the entrance of the tunnel. And you can remove the head of the Golden Buddha, and there is a uh, diamond inside, more or less two cups of diamond, a big diamond. 25 years after these photographs were taken, an American court awarded one of the largest judgments in legal history to the Rojas family against the heirs of the dictator Marcos, $22 billion. As Rojas told it, shortly after he discovered the Buddha, agents of Marcos raided his home and confiscated it. 
a media outcry ensued. Two weeks later, the Buddha was returned. After nine days, when they raided the house, they surrendered, the, uh, the military raided her house. They surrendered the Buddha at the Baguio City Hall, but it's a fake, a fake Buddha. Rojas alleged a switch. This Buddha was made of bronze and its head did not detach. Rojas was arrested. Under duress, he retracted his protest. It was only 20 years later, after Marcos's fall from power, that Rojas felt safe enough to pursue the former president in court. He claimed Marcos still had the original gold Buddha and sued him for its return. Despite the doubts and rumors, Rojas always maintained that his Buddha was made of gold and that Marcos stole it. Just before Rojas was due to fly to Hawaii to give evidence against Marcos, he died. His friends and family claim he was murdered, poisoned by Marcos. But the Rojas case was about to take a dramatic twist. A witness was produced who claimed he'd seen a Buddha identical to Rojas's in Marcos's now abandoned summer palace in the Philippines. A witness who helped swing the trial the Rojas's way. And who may be the key to the truth about Yamashita's gold. The Golden Buddha case, brought by Rogelio Rojas against the Marcoses in the American courts, revealed a web of intrigue in the Philippines. Rojas's lawyers had to prove that the Buddha found by their client was made of gold, and that former Philippines president Ferdinand Marcos stole it. As part of their case, they brought forward a treasure hunter named Robert Curtis. If you want to get to the truth about Yamashita's gold, you're going to come across the name of Curtis, an ex-auto salesman who started working in the precious metals business in the 1970s. Curtis's story is that in 1975, he saw a golden Buddha at Marcos's now abandoned summer palace a claim he repeated under oath to lawyers for Rojas. While you were there at the uh, Summer Palace, did you see any gold? Yes. Uh, where, in what form was the gold? Well, one was a Buddha and the other were bars. And where did you see a Buddha? In his office. That photograph contains a picture of two people and a picture of a Buddha with some rope around it. Uh, do you recognize the Buddha in that photograph? That's the Buddha that I saw on the floor of the Summer Palace. There's no question there's there only be one Buddha like that. Curtis's testimony supported other evidence in the case for the Rojases. And in August of 1996, a court in Hawaii awarded Rojas's heirs one of the biggest damages judgments in legal history. $22 billion. The trial, busily occupied recovering billions, hundreds perhaps, hundreds of billions of dollars worth of gold, and they knew that there were a great many more sites yet to be uncovered after that. So it's self-evident that the reason to get rid of Yamashita was to get rid of the man who would know that you had done this. Marcos was a villain. The list of people he harmed is a long one. Another who says he's owed money by the Marcos family is Robert Curtis. He says that Marcos had acquired a fortune in gold and that the dictator hired him to find more. During this meeting with the president, uh, he was trying to eliminate any doubts that I had. So um, the purpose of the trip was to show me gold. 
he asked General Bear to take me downstairs and show me some uh, gold that was recovered from one of his sites. Well, there was a hallway and uh, some guards at a door, um, which they opened up and I went in. And uh, there were gold stacked from floor to ceiling. I was amazed that they could get that much gold stacked up that high. Curtis says that Marcos and the treasure hunters had acquired maps to 172 Japanese burial sites. The story of where these maps came from and how Marcos's group acquired them is a romantic one. The version offered by Curtis and others is that the maps were left with a Filipino, Ben Valmores, at the end of the war. According to this story, Valmores had served as valet to the Japanese officer responsible for the treasure burials, Prince Takeda. Valmores is the key eyewitness. Uh, he visited the treasure sites. He went with his prince during the excavation, uh, during the loading of the treasure into the vaults, and then during the final inventories before the vaults were sealed. Toward the end of the war, uh, he went with Prince Takeda up to the northern end where they rendezvoused with a Japanese submarine, and it was arranged for Prince Takeda to be smuggled out of uh, the Philippines to Japan. He turned to Ben, and he left his satchel full of original treasure maps with Ben, figuring that if the submarine were sunk on its way back to Japan, Ben would ob obligate himself to turn the satchel over to Takeda's family after the war. Marcos, he says, learnt of the existence of the maps. He dispatched one of his top treasure hunters, a Colonel Villacrucis, to get hold of them. Colonel Villacrucis see the map because he's the one who break the lock. And he says to me, Ben, this is a map of treasure. So I was surprised when he says that, that uh, that is a map of treasure. So I said, no, maybe, I don't know. The Labour Group was the name of Marcos's treasure hunting team. It included Villacrucis and Valmores. Robert Curtis says that he was asked to join the group. His tasks, to decode the Japanese maps and to find the gold. Then, he says, he had to use his metallurgical knowledge to re-smelt the gold so that its origins were disguised. Curtis uh, was a success. He reverse-engineered about eight sites, and one of them, the most celebrated, was called Teresa. Teresa II, actually, because there are four different Teresa sites on the same odd-shaped Sugarloaf Mountain. Curtis says that the Teresa site was selected as the first test of his engineering skills. Beneath it lay an underground complex built by slave labour. The Valmores maps indicated it held army trucks filled with bullion, solid gold Buddhas and precious gems. Sixty feet down, Curtis claims they hit a Japanese booby trap. Curtis says Marcos's troops cleared the site as a safety measure, but he was never allowed to return. Shortly after, he says he was forced to leave the Philippines in fear of his life. On July 5th, 1975, uh, uh, Colonel Lachica picked me up to take me to see General there and President Marcos, but instead took me to the um, U.S. military uh, cemetery in Fort Bonifacio, where I was led to a group of rhododendron bushes, and I saw this hole in the ground, big enough to sit my body in, and uh, Colonel Chica put a 45 behind my ear and told me, we're good friends, but I'm sorry I have to do this. Obviously, you're still here, so I assume the gun was not fired. Well, I'm a good talker. <laughs> Were you able to talk your way out of it? Yes. And Amazingly, uh, I did. 
Did you then decide it was time to leave the Philippines? Wouldn't you? Yes. At that point, Marcos came in with his soldiers, and they removed only the gold that they found in the back of eight or nine army trucks that were in one of the tunnels. The amount of gold Marcos recovered was $9 billion worth of gold in 1975 values. After that, gold prices went way up. Back in the US, Curtis went public with his story. It was embarrassing for the Marcos regime and excited huge interest among treasure hunters. Curtis claimed to have photographed and then burned the original treasure maps before leaving the Philippines. He was now the key source of information about the supposed 172 sites. Few questions. But in April 1996, a Japanese documentary crew caught on tape a cave full of gold bars said to be worth over $150 million. For many, this was incontrovertible proof of the existence of the Yamashita treasure. I'd made several programs about the Philippines since 1987, and all throughout that time, I thought I'd like to do a program about the Yamashita treasure. Then, in the winter of 1995, someone brought me a videotape. I had a look at it and saw that it contained footage of several hundred gold bars in the jungle in the Philippines. As a result of that, I really wanted to get some film of it for myself. Until I saw the gold actually in front of me, I really didn't think it existed. But suddenly it was there, right in front of my eyes. My first reaction was, this is amazing. The documentary crew were given samples from one of the gold bars, which they took back to Tokyo for testing. The tests proved it was high-grade gold. <laughs> 